longer one, and go to Psalm 23. And I don't know, you know, I, maybe nobody's ever done this before, connected Revelation with Psalms. I'm, you know, I mean, it's not something you would normally do, but I'm finding that the themes that run through it are very similar as you go, so it's kind of a cool thing to do. Uh, anyway, uh, we're not really studying Psalm, but we're reading one before, before we start in on Revelation. So Psalm 23, probably familiar to most of you. Uh, the Lord, the psalmist's shepherd is the note that I, in my Bible, the Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou dost prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. All right, so with that, let's get back into Revelation. And for those of you who have been following us, and for those of you who haven't, we've been in Revelation for a long time, or at least the lessons have been on Revelation, but we haven't gotten too far because we actually just started going through the Scripture. Uh, actually, I need that. Um, we just started going through the Scriptures a couple weeks ago, and we've gotten through uh, chapters 1 and 2. And, of course, chapter 2 is where uh, we start seeing the, the messages that Jesus has to the seven churches. And so we've gotten through four of them, uh, the, the, the letter to Ephesus, to Smyrna, Pergamum, and Thyatira. Um, we talked about Ephesus, that uh, they were complimented in a lot of things, but the big thing that Jesus had against them was they had left their first love. I know Charles and Jimmy had a conversation about some of that and a little bit of, of what was going on with that, and I'll probably circle back around on that a little bit as we get to the end of the letters and kind of summarize everything there. Um, then, uh, so we did, so we went over Ephesus and then Smyrna. Um, Smyrna there was complimented. Uh, there wasn't anything that they were told they had to change, but they were told that they were about to undergo or were undergoing a, a great persecution. Uh, so we, we talked about that. Uh, then there was Pergamum. Uh, Jesus tells them that they live where Satan's throne is. We talked about whether that was actually a physical locality or because of the worship of false gods and things that were going on there, kind of both actually uh, coinciding there. Um, and we talked about Balaam. I don't know if you remember that, the teaching of Balaam and the idols and, and all that, those things. Uh, and then they were told that they needed to repent, those who were following the teaching of Balaam uh, and the Nicolaitans. And then Thyatira, um, he compliments them on their deeds, love, faith, service, and perseverance, uh, and that their current deeds are greater than what they did at first, but it's only one verse that's given to that, to the positives, and then the, the rest of it is talked about is negative, dealing with uh, the fact that they tolerated Jezebel, um, and we talked about who Jezebel was and, and what, what that might mean, but basically... It was false teaching, right? They were dealing with false teaching, and, they, and some of them were accepting this um, and the problem that they had, had with that. So that's a real quick, rough <laughs> summary of, of those four. And we're ready to get into Sardis here uh, in chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And I think Terry's going to be reading for us this, this week. So, Terry, if you want to read uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. To the, to the, angels, to the angel of the church in Sardis write, he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain, which were about to die. For I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. So remember what you have received and heard, and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come to you like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life. And I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right. So this uh, message is given to the church in Sardis, and Sardis was the capital of Lydia, a province of Asia Minor. Um, 
the, we got the, the map this time, right? So we can kind of show where, where these things are. So, um, so you can see Sardis right above Philadelphia there, yep, in, inland. Um, and it was known as an impregnable fortress. Uh, it was 1,500 feet up on a ledge of rock jutting out of the side of a mountain. Uh, so people thought that they were safe there. However, it was conquered at least twice, uh, probably because those who were in it thought they couldn't be uh, taken. Uh, it was a considerable distance inland uh, northeast of Ephesus and was important in war times, but was too far out of the way to be important for commerce. Uh, so McGuigan notes that the city had a glorious past and promised much, but it was now dead. Uh, like I said before, sometimes he likes to kind of link what's going on physically with the, to what the, the spiritual situation in the church. Like I said, don't know how much that actually applies, but it is interesting to, to see it, how it links to each other. Um, once again, the, the first verse that we see here lets them know that these words are coming directly from Jesus uh, and, and that he's the one in charge of the church. Uh, do you remember what the seven spirits are? He who has the seven spirits. We talked about seven, right? What's seven mean? Perfection, completeness, indicating whenever it's in, used in relation with something else, like, uh, for instance, uh, seven eyes or seven stars, these things, when it's used, seven churches, uh, those kind of things, a lot of times it means something in connection with what it's talking about. So like seven eyes would be all seeing or all knowing uh, would be the, the message being relayed. Um, so there, in this case, the seven spirits are associated with the seven eyes if we go to chapter five or six, which we'll get to later. Um, so, and it's indicated of completeness or fullness. So, uh, it could be talking about Christ being all seeing or all knowing. Seven spirits also are used in relation to the Holy Spirit. So we can kind of get that, uh, that, that, uh, connection as well. Um, but anyway, I think the thing, the, the, the main thing here would be all seeing and all knowing, uh, indicating his power again uh, and authority. So what does Jesus compliment the church in Sardis for? I'm getting a bunch of blank stares. Nothing, right? <laughs> what does he say immediately? What's the first thing he says? Wake up. Yeah, wake up. You're dead. Um, so... Uh, Later in the message, he does call out that there are some who have not soiled their garments. Uh, so there are some uh, that are still following him. Uh, but there is no praise given to the church as a whole at all. Um, how might a church have a name for which they are alive but actually be dead? That's what... It's, it kind of goes to a lot of what we see in the scriptures at various points, right? The, the Pharisees, what were they focused on? Show. Appearance, right? So, so things look good, but underneath there, there isn't a lot of good. And we'll, we'll actually catch that more here later as well. Um, so so there, there's that, um, that you could be, that we also talked about like, yeah, you could also be just going through the motions and not really mean what you're doing as a possibility. Uh, they seem to have it all, probably. <laughs> they're, they're, uh, everything. They appear like they're doing good things, but they're, they're really not there. Um, so, uh, actually, let's just go ahead and go to it right now. I, was, I had Matthew 23, 25 through 28 that I wanted to read in conjunction with that. Because this is where we're talking about the Pharisees here. Ma Matthew 23, 25 through 28. If it's not up there, I can get... Yeah, there it is. Yep. Go ahead. Oh, maybe I don't. I got 20. 
Uh, it's up on the screen there, 23, 25 through 28, yep. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cups of the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup and to the then of the dish so that the outside of it may become clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. All right, thank you. So yeah, that's kind of what it brings to my mind anyway, whenever, uh, whenever the, with that statement about having, having the, uh, that they have a name that they're alive, but, but they're actually dead. Um, so we talked about this before, but he tells them they need to repent. What does it mean to repent? Change something, right? <laughs> yep, make a change. So there was something going on in the church uh, that, they needed, that they needed to change. And he warns them that if they don't make the change, what's going to happen? Judgment, right? It's going to come like a thief in the night. And that reminds you of 1 Thessalonians 5 too, right? Come like a thief in the night. Uh, and other parables that Jesus talks about uh, in Matthew 25 and, and things like that. So uh, in verse 4, he mentions that those that walk with him in white, that there are those who have walked with, walk with him in night, white who have not soiled their garments. Um, so when we become Christians, Christ's blood covers our sins and we're made white as snow. That's a reference in Revelation 7.14. And his blood covers us as long as we remain, remain his. So I think that those who have soiled their garments, what does that mean if... If we're washed in Christ's blood and we're made pure, how can we become soiled again? Yep, going back or, or, or deviating from what we're supposed to be doing. So it could be going back to what you were doing or veering off in another direction. Um, so uh, those, you know, that's a scary place to be to, to have been covered by Christ's blood, and then to uh, not be covered by it anymore. And, and we, we, there's other passages that talk about that as well. Um, in this case, I think the emphasis is on being clothed with white garments, remaining pure and faithful to Christ. And Jesus says he'll call out the name of those that do so. So that's, once again, the encouragement to stay faithful, to stay true uh, to, to, what, uh, to hit what he tells us to do and to the faith. All right, any other comments on Sardis? Any big things that I missed before we uh, head on to the next one? All right, so let's go ahead and, Terry, if you want to read 7 through 13 of Revelation. Yeah, I'm here. It's yep, there it is. And to the angels of the church in Philadelphia write, Who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens, says this, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door, which no one can shut, because you have a little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogues of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you, because you have kept the word of my perseverance. I also will keep you from the hour of testing, the hour which is about to come upon the whole world. To test those who dwell on the earth, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have so that you will not take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God the new Jerusalem which comes down out of the heaven from my God and my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right. Uh, we want, if we want to put the map back up, I know it was up just a minute ago. But uh, so for Philadelphia, I think it was yeah, just down below Sardis a little bit there in the middle. Um, somewhere uh, between Sardis and Laodicea. Um, it was built by a 
pergamine, I don't even know how you pronounce that, pergamini, mini, mean, something like that, a uh, king called Atalus Philadelphus. So I guess that's where the name came from. Uh, and uh, grapes were a major crop there, so the god Dionysus was prominent among the residents there. Uh, there were also some Jews in the city, and they seemed to have been powerful in causing a, a problem there. Um, the church is said to have existed in this city longer than any of the other seven that had the letters addressed to them, uh, which once again makes sense whenever you, to at least some degree, whenever you look through what's said to them. Uh, Jesus is introduced in this message as being holy and having the key of David. What is the key of David? All I know is you can't, they can't shut it. And they can't open it. <laughs> he has the key. He's the one that can shut and open it, right? Uh, it's a reference to Isaiah 22, 22, which was a prophecy about Christ and therefore a symbol of his authority again. Once, just, you get the theme as he, as he writes to these churches, what, what's being done there. Uh, Jesus came from David's line. That's, of course, emphasized in the Old Testament prophecies and in his lineage that we see in the Gospels. And at the time of Isaiah's prophecy, the Messiah hadn't come yet. So, of course, we know it was referencing to the future. And uh, so Jesus has that key. He's the one that it was, the prophecy was for uh, and the one that's doing it uh, or that has that power. Uh, what does Jesus compliment the church for? Keep in his word, not denying his name. And opposite of, of uh, well, not opposite. Actually, it's the same as what he says to Sardis as far as he knows their deeds. But in this case, what's the indication? Their deeds please him, right? Whereas the deeds that, was go that were going on in Sardis didn't. That tells you that the same thing, like we can do the same thing, right? And, and it can be totally different as far as what it means. What, what, what would that difference be? It has, it has to relate to the heart, I think, to why you're doing it and how you're doing it, right? Um, so they have, so they, he knows their deeds. They've kept his word. What else? They've endured suffering. Endured suffering. Probably at the Jews' hands, based on what's said here, right? And they haven't broken. Did I, I forget, did I have, let me see, do I have this one down? I don't have this one down. So in Isaiah, so we won't read this one, but Isaiah 56, verses 3 through 8, it discusses how God's people are both Jew and Gentile when they do what God tells them to do. Uh, and this seems to fit the church in Philadelphia, right? Um, so, uh, so he's pleased with them because they're doing what he has told them to do. Um, what issues does Jesus have with the church? He doesn't indicate anything, right? Well, so this is the second church that we see where there isn't anything indicated. He mentions that they only have a little power. And notice that it's only little, they only have little power. I, even I said it wrong as I said it. It doesn't say a little power. They have little power. Um, we've talked about that, how there's no uh, uh, now I even forget the name for that word. Of the, of a, all those words, what are those called? In English? Nobody knows their English here? All right, I'm not the only one that forgot. Uh, okay, well, anyway, there's none of those words, those little uh, words in, in, in the Greek. Um, and... Uh, but uh, so it says little power, which might indicate that they're small in number or had little political influence uh, in, in, this, in the situation that they're in. Most of the message is telling them that Jesus is providing an opportunity for them. Uh, I believe this message is very relevant to our church here. As we talk about, uh, we may be small in number, but we need to stay faithful and look for opportunities to be a service in our community and to spread God's word, right? Um, Jesus also says that he is going to bring some type of punishment on the Jews that are causing the church issues here. 
Uh, th this seems to be something specific to the situation in Philadelphia, not like across the board. Uh, se seems like, uh, it, it, but it also makes me think about how the final judgment, all people will fall on their knees before God and will worship him, no matter what, <laughs> no matter what's happened. Um, one interesting thing here that said is what is the hour of trial that Jesus says he's going to keep them from? Does, what does that mean? Is it opposite of what he said to the church where he says, uh, the, the church in Smyrna, <laughs> where, where they're going to suffer tribulation for 10 days? Is, that, is it the opposite of that? Or is it more of a just a, you're going to be able to withstand it, encouragement type thing. That's kind of the way I've seen, seen it interpreted in, by different people. Uh, Heinz thinks that it's more of a general statement that Christ would see them through the trials that they're undergoing. Uh, McGuigan, also kind of coinciding with that, doesn't think that that means they're given an exemption from trials, which is what it kind of sounds like, right? Like, you're going to not miss this. But they didn't, they didn't necessarily think that that it was saying you're gonna, gonna just not have to deal with this. He, they think uh, it's more that they'll be able to for, be fortified to withstand them or, or maybe not have as tough of a time as like the church in Sardis was going to, or Smyrna, excuse me. Uh, and uh, now what, as I said, I'm, not, I'm not gonna get too much into the other lines of thinking. This is pretty much from the, the viewpoint of uh, that th this is all relating to Rome mostly and, and to the, those things, but uh, just so that for your information, the premillennialist thinking relates this statement to certain events in the Great Tribulation and Rapture. I read a lot of that, uh, of that, that was going on. So um, I don't think, they, they kind of think of that because they really don't know what the event is applying to. But just because we don't know exactly what the event refers to, I don't think that it gives credence to the interpretation that doesn't line up with other things that we've talked about. Like you don't go somewhere you don't go to a different place just because you don't know totally what the answer is as to what, it, what it's talking about. Um, so as we've talked about, they're looking for these things to happen in the future. Uh, and I'll talk more about that as, as we go, not a lot, but just a little bit, just to point out the differences here as we go through it. Um, but, but one thing that I find very interesting as I'm going through all this, and I'll say this real quick right now, uh, even though it's not really at this point, uh, is that when you look at the predictions that were being done by many of the most significant premillennialists, the people that you might be familiar with, like the, uh, the people that wrote Left Behind series and things like that, most of them thought that Jesus was going to come back to establish his kingdom or the rapture and all, all those kind of events was going to happen in the 80s or 90s. <laughs> so that tells you kind of that they, they, they can't predict what's going on from, from these things. Like, they, there's no, it's not, it doesn't make sense to try to relate them to the things going on today because they, they just will keep changing as, as time goes on here. Um, but I found that rather interesting that as I was reading through a lot of the stuff, that most of the stuff that they were predicting was supposed to have happened 20 years ago or 30 years ago uh, based off of their predictions. Uh, anyway, um, so as we get to the end of the message to Philadelphia, Jesus says the phrase, he who overcomes, as an encouragement. And this time he says that the overcomer will be made a pillar in the temple. Of course, the temple was where God lived, right? So to speak, lived. Uh, and the pillar indicates permanence. So what do you think that this is indicating for, for the Christians there? Yeah, it's security again, right? Yeah, this is what, this is what you've been promised, the knowledge that you belong to God. And, and um, of course, it can be applied to an eternal reward in heaven. Uh, but I also think it, it refers to the security you have as part of the church and in the promises that God makes to people. Um, and I have a couple reasons for that. Uh, it says the name of God will be written on them. What name is that? What are God's people called? Christians, right? 
Uh, and then he discusses the new Jerusalem that comes down out of heaven. Uh, and as we've already talked about when we talked about the symbols, some people relate this to heaven, the new Jerusalem, but that's not, that's not what I think it's referring to. The new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven. It's a new city. And if you go back to other prophecies and things like that, it's referring to the church. So once again, Christians, church. Uh, we can have security in, in, uh, in that. All right, so that's Philadelphia. Anybody have any other comments on Philadelphia before we move on? All right, so let's move on to Laodicea. That's in chap uh, chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. Which one are you looking at? Isaiah. Revelation 3, 14 through 22. That I might have skipped Isaiah, or might have just talked about it. <laughs> to the angel of the church of Laodicea write, the amen, the faithful, and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, this, say this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth because you say I am rich and I have become wealthy, and I have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments that you may clothe yourselves and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see Oh, he says, and I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him, and I will dine with him and he with me. He will overcome. I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I ha also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right. So this is probably the most well-known to the message of the messages to the to the churches. Uh, do you remember why that is? What which phrase it is that everybody always remembers to the Laodiceans? <coughs> They're lukewarm, and he's going to spit spit them out, right? Um, so, once again, the message begins with a statement about Jesus having authority over the church. He is the beginning of creation, the amen, and the faithful and true witness. And we see a lot of that as we go through Revelation. Like I said, the focus, there's a focus of Jesus and, and the church being victorious over the enemies of God. Um, here again, uh, Jesus, kind of like with, uh, what was it, Sardis, uh, doesn't really have a lot to compliment the church on. Um, what, what problems does he have with the church? About gold. What's that? Not needing anything. They, have everything they, they need. think they have everything they need. They think that, that uh, they're rich when they actually have nothing. Uh, what is that? To me, that calls to mind uh, some, some other scriptures that we have where it talks about how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now then, in this case, I think we're talking spiritual here, but at the same time, I think it also relates to physical. Whenever what happens whenever we don't have any physical needs, whenever we're wealthy, what do people tend to do? I wouldn't know. <laughs> we don't know. Um, they become lackadaisical. Yeah, we. Yeah, maybe I should rephrase the way I ask. What, where we see the gospel growing the most, or the church growing the most is in places that are, people are poorer because they realize that they're looking for something else, that, that it's not themselves to rely on. A lot of times when you're wealthy and you have what you need, you have a tendency for self, to rely on yourself or to think you can rely on yourself. So I think that that kind of uh, uh, applies to some degree. But of course, like I said, here I think we're talking spiritual. They thought they were rich spiritually, even though they had nothing. Um, they, they seem to have lost their zeal for him. Uh, he says that he knows their deeds, and they, these deeds must not have been in accordance with his will, or if they were, they had the same problem that some of the other churches we talked about had. Um, 
And he says they are blind, poor, and naked, indicating they don't realize their horrible circumstances. So can this happen in churches today? Absolutely. Probably is. Yeah, it, it is happening in churches today, isn't it? Um, and what, just like we talked about with some of these other, other churches that we're, that we're seeing the warnings going to, we need to take it to heart ourselves and, and apply it to ourselves uh, when, to make sure that it doesn't happen to us. So Jesus knows this is a harsh, harsh message, so he indicates that he loves them by saying he reproves and disciplines those he loves. Um, what's the purpose of discipline? To get you to change, right? So let's go to Hebrews 12, 4 through 13, where God tells us what he thinks about it. Is that up there? Got it. Is it up there? Yep. 4 through 12? 4 through 13. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation, exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And he sources or scourges, scourges every son whom I received. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. And with son is there whom his father does not discipline. But if you are without discipline, of which you are, be, which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore. We, have, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they discipline us for a short time, as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, so that we may share his holiness. And discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruits of righteousness. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble, and make straight paths for your feet, so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. All right, thanks, Terry. All right, so in this passage, God compares himself to a father who wants what's best for his children. And we all know that there, of course, are parents that sometimes don't want that, and it's not always the case that, that the discipline that they meet out is meant for good, but God is saying when parents who want what's best for their children discipline their children, why are they doing it? Teach them a lesson. To, to get them to do what's right, right? And so uh, we, what he's saying here to the Laodiceans is, I know this is a tough message, but I, I want you to let me back in, basically. Uh, you need correction. Um, it's meant to bring about, you know, righteousness, uh, you know, and of course, when God disciplines, God knows what he's doing. When we discipline, I don't, you know, all of you parents out there, we, we sometimes make mistakes when we discipline, right? We don't always do it the right way. Um, but, uh, when God does it, it's, it's done the way that it needs to be done. Uh, so I think that's important to realize as well. Um, so Jesus tells the Laodiceans that he wants them to let him back in. So what does that indicate, that statement? That he still cares about them. That he still cares about them. But he's not there. And that he, they had left him. Yeah. Not, not, he didn't leave them. They left him. Um, so I think, uh, you know, Jesus was no longer the reason that the church was gathering together, is what it kind of seems to indicate. He, there was no longer the bond uh, holding the group together there. Uh, kind of like the Ephesians and some of the language here, though he doesn't talk about taking the candlestick away like he did with the Ephesians. He says, I'm going to spit you out, which kind of, kind of links to me something similar there. Um, so the churches started with them coming together as Christians, but something had changed as, as time went on here. Uh, they're warned to come back to him or they would be rejected or put another way, they'd be lost, right? Um, so, so this is also similar to how Paul warned the Galatians about 
when you remember when the Galatians were trying to be saved under the old law, like they had they had accepted Christ, put him on in baptism, uh, and were following Christ, but then they had been led astray and were teaching that they had to be uh, do they had to follow the old law, um, and so they had fallen from grace. So on the flip side, if they returned to Christ, they would become rich and wear white garments, uh, or they would become pure again and be saved. And if they would open the door to Jesus, he would have fellowship with them again. So once again, indicating that when we belong to Jesus, when we become his children, he's not ever going to let us go. It's, it's the other way around. It's going to be us that, that do it. And, and we see that, unfortunately, a lot, um, ha- happen a lot. Um, so finally, they are told that if they overcome, they will sit with Christ on his throne. Uh, this, once again, can have a reference to eternity, obviously. You can think of it that way. But it can also apl- be applied to current circumstances. Uh, because of their current condition, they had no authority to judge. Or maybe more accurately, they couldn't judge rightly. You know, we're told as Christians uh, to judge rightly. Um, so uh, they weren't capable of, of leading others to Christ because they weren't doing it right themselves. They had no authority to do that. They couldn't do it. Um, all right. Anybody have any other comments on Laodicea? He's talking to them not as people who are not yet lost. So he says you're being disciplined because that's what fathers do to their sons. They're not done yet. They're not done yet, right, yeah. And, and I think it's important that we understand people can, in the modern day, can we make terrible mistakes? Absolutely. Does that mean we're toast? No. No, in fact, in fact it's quite the opposite. We can make mistakes as Christians and be saved. That's where it gets a little complicated because it's like, okay, well, where have you fallen to that point where you're no longer covered by Jesus' blood. I think it's that point where you turn your back. Right, when you when you've turned on Jesus and what and when is that? When does that when does that happen? So you can, you can keep going down the line. It gets a little tough, but the the point is, is that we don't have to worry about failing in something we're doing, you know, making a mistake. We don't have to worry about that. Because as long as we're following Jesus and trying to do what's right, and that could, even that statement could be taken out of context and be like, oh, well, you're saying that you could go and do something wrong, and that's not what I'm saying. Just like what Paul said, may we sin that grace shall increase? No, of course not. That's not what we're saying. We're saying that we don't have to live in fear that when we make one mistake, we're going to be sent to hell, which is what some people are scared of, right? We don't have to think that way. We can, we can know that we're saved as long as we're trying to follow Jesus, and do what he tells us to. Once again, it doesn't mean we can get everything wrong. <laughs> like, we, we have to try to do what's right. We have to, we have to go to his word, and we have to follow it. Uh, so, so whenever you talk about the, that kind of an issue, you really have to try to qualify what you're saying and, and, and make everyone understand. You're, not, you're speaking in generalities, not, not specifics per se. Or maybe it's the other way around. I don't know. Um, but anyway, um, okay, so what can we learn from the messages that Jesus gave to the churches at this time? What are some things that we've talked about? Or as, as you go through each of these, we've talked about several things that are similar that he says to each church at the beginning, his, his, his introductory, and at the end, there's certain things. So what are those things? What can we see? Well, you hope you're never in a place where God abandons you. You know, where you've come to that point where He's done with you. And that's, right. That's bad. God, and God will never abandon us unless we've abandoned him. That's that, and that's kind of, I think that's the point of the, the ending statements where it talks about uh, each letter includes a phrase, he who overcomes and then has the promise of a reward. So this statement indicates that the one who doesn't overcome will not receive the reward. So we have to stay faithful the whole way. Uh, and it also indicates that the one who does overcome or stays faithful the whole way will receive that reward, we also as we're promised. The church's conditions, uh, if you don't do this, you don't receive Right. Well, and it's within the churches, we can see that we as individual Christians are responsible to obey God even when those around us 
are not. Like, we, there's several churches here where it says, you know, this is, you're doing wrong here, but for those who haven't done this or who aren't following this teaching, um, that, then they, it says, you know, hold fast, continue on. Um, each congregation receives praise and or rebuke, um, or at least most of them anyway. <laughs> um, but with the congregations that are rebuked, there is mention of those that are still at least doing something correct. So we are individually responsible. We can't rely, we, we should rely on each other as Christians, but at the same time, we can't rely on each other uh, to, to, for our salvation. Or, or just because one of us goes down the wrong road doesn't mean we all should go down the wrong road. Um, we, we also see that uh, in those introductories that Jesus is the head of the church and has all power and authority and that he knows our deeds, and he's pleased when we do his will. I think that's emphasized over and over again in those introductory statements. We also see that God will allow his people to undergo severe trials. That's mentioned over and over again here. We see that there will be false teaching that's going to happen, and that's going to happen within the church. Right? These are letters to the churches, and you have people following the way of Balaam, Jezebel, the Nicolaitans. So we have a lot of false teaching going on within the churches. Um, we also see the, the rewards. The re rewards are emphasized here uh, in each case and are meant as encouragement to stay faithful until death no matter what goes on here on earth. And just so you can, uh, just to summarize these rewards, because you see them, they're, they're kind of placed, placed throughout. The rewards are, number one, to eat of the tree of life, two, to receive a crown of life and not be hurt by the second death, Three, to receive the hidden manna, the white stone, and a new name. We've talked about what those, those things mean. Uh, to receive authority to rule the nations. To be clothed with white garments and to be named before God. To be made a pillar in the temple of God and have the names of God and Christ written on us. And then to be allowed to sit with Christ on his throne. So those are, those are some pretty good things that we want to aspire to, Right? And then finally, the statement made to each church about he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, indicates the importance of these messages and that they are meant to be heeded by all Christians throughout all time, I think. That's, to me, that's, that it applies across the board. Um, so I think those are the big, thing, big takeaways that I get from, from those letters or messages to the churches. And uh, I hope... Uh, Hope it's been beneficial as we've gone through them for everybody. All right, so next week we'll get into the more apocalyptic uh, stuff in, in, in Revelation. We'll start in on chapter 4, and I don't have any idea how far we'll get. My intention was to go through much more quickly than what we are, but uh, there's a lot of good stuff here, so we'll see, we'll see how, uh, how we do. But uh, we'll be back in a few minutes for worship.